Good afternoon, and uh, we'll get started here today. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. This webinar presented by Behavioral Economics in Action at Rotman in partnership with the Behaviorally Informed Organizations Partnership. This is our second webinar of this academic year. My name is Matt Hilchey, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow here with the Behavioral Economics in Action at Rotman team. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Behavioral Economics in Action at Rotman is a research center at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management, whose three programmatic missions are to research, educate, and engage in meaningful outreach with our academic, governmental, and industry partners. These monthly webinars are our way of hearing firsthand from academics and practitioners who are making a meaningful impact in the world of behavioral insights. In particular, behaviorally informed business and evidence-based public policy. Today, we we're delighted to welcome Sasha Tregobov, who is the Director of Behavioral Insight Team Canada. Before I introduce Sasha, I'd like to go over the ground rules for this webinar. Following our introduction, our speaker will deliver a 30 to 35 minute presentation. During the presentation, please submit questions for our speaker by clicking the chat tab at the top right of your WebEx screen and typing into the entry box. These questions will be visible to all of the participants at the end of the talk and time permitting, We'll have a question and answer session in which I will select questions from the chat tab to ask our speaker. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sasha Tregobov. Sasha is the Director of Behavioral Insight Team Canada, or BIT Canada, leading its recently opened office in Toronto and in its work across Canada. Sasha holds a master's degree in public policy and administration from Ryerson University and started off his career as a policy advisor with the Government of Ontario. Before taking on his current role, Sasha oversaw BIT's work with local governments in the U.S. through the What Works Cities initiative. This initiative helps cities build their capacity for using data and evidence, including the application of behavioral insights. Prior to joining BIT, Sasha co-developed and led Deloitte's Can Canadian Behavioral Insights capabilities, where he consulted to public sector organizations across Canada with a focus on strategy and innovation. On behalf of the whole behavioral insights community here in Toronto, we warmly welcome Sasha. Thank you for being here with us today. Take it away. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, so I'm delighted to have this opportunity to uh, deliver this um, uh, webinar today, the uh, primary focus of which will be an emerging area of work for the Behavioral Insights team globally and right here at home in Canada, which is about uh, applications of behavioral science to workplace well-being with a particular focus on returning burnout, uh, reducing burnout. Um, so uh, let me just start, though, uh, by briefly saying a little bit about myself and a little bit about the Behavioral Insights team uh, for those who aren't um, uh, familiar with us uh, already. Um, so uh, as Matthew so kindly uh, shared in the introduction, um, oh, can folks hear me? Yep. Oh, great. OK, sorry about that. Uh, message that made me think the that was not the case. Um, yeah, so anyways, as Matthew was saying, uh, my background is not actually in, in behavioral science. I, I'm not a trained behavioral scientist. I uh, came to this work with a background in public policy and, and public administration. Um, and I came to my role with the behavioral insights team uh, through a mix, uh, again, as Matthew said, of uh, consulting experience with a focus on uh, public sector and, and policy innovation and then uh, direct experience working um, uh, in government. Uh, immediately before joining uh, uh, the Brooklyn office, uh, I did this work um, at Deloitte um, in, in Toronto and um, really thrilled to now be back here, uh, which is home for me. I'm, I'm from Toronto originally, uh, back home uh, in, in Toronto uh, with the opportunity to open BIT's uh, uh, newest uh, international office. Uh, to uh, work with partners all across Canada. Uh, so the Behavioral Insights team, uh, for those who aren't familiar, uh, was founded uh, about nine years ago now in 2010, actually as part of the UK government, um, right at the heart of the UK government in their cabinet office organization. And it was, um, I believe it was the first uh, of what are now, I believe literally hundreds of uh, government uh, organizations and institutions across the world that are uh, dedicated to the application of, of behavioral insights to the work of government. Um, we've gone on sort of quite the journey uh, in, in these nine years, including uh, coming outside of government. So we're now an independent 
a social purpose company. Uh, there's about 190 of us, uh, which is sort of amazing uh, to say uh, we're in seven uh, different offices uh, all over the world, London, New York, which is where I worked um, uh, before moving to Toronto, Sydney, Wellington, uh, Manchester, and of course our, our head office in London. Um, across this sort of global network, um, we've been able to just do a real sort of diversity and array of behavioral insights um, projects. I believe at latest count, we were actually over uh, 500 randomized control trials or uh, other forms of experimental evaluation, uh, testing um, ideas and interventions informed by behavioral science. So um, as we've sort of developed this uh, wealth of expertise and, um, and experience, it's been really exciting to push into some newer areas, uh, some sort of um, areas that are perhaps less, uh, less um, traditional uh, for the behavioral science community uh, like, like burnout. Um, I should say before I get into that, we've basically got two areas of uh, capability within our organization that we combine on the project work that we do. Uh, so the first is on the sort of behavioral science side, uh, taking all this fascinating research that's happening in applied and academic circles around behavioral economics, social psychology, neuroscience, and related disciplines that are um, giving us this much more nuanced, realistic model of uh, how people um, make choices, uh, process information, and, and ultimately sort of behave. Um, and then applying that understanding in really sort of concrete and uh, discrete ways um, uh, to the work of social impact focused organizations. Um, but then, of course, we always sort of try to combine that with a sort of rigorous evaluation approach. There's a lot more that we don't know, um, I think, about sort of human behavior and, and cognition than we do know. And one of the things we do know is that um, things are highly context dependent and that in environments have uh, sort of really significant effects. And so um, both those factors combine for us uh, to create a bit of an imperative around really rigorously evaluating our ideas before we uh, recommend to our partners that they sort of scale them up or, or otherwise sort of uh, leverage the process and the results. Um, so that's who I am and, and that's who we are at the Behavioral Insights team. Um, what I'd like to spend most of this uh, 30 to 35 minutes uh, talking about is a project that we completed fairly recently um, in the U.S. Uh, around reducing burnout um, among 911 uh, dispatchers or call takers. Uh, for those of you who aren't in North America, this is the sort of emergency dispatchers who um, uh, will uh, take calls from the public and um, triage to determine whether it's sort of police, fire, ambulance that need to respond. So we were approached um, in our work with U.S. cities um, by a, a really large number of cities that flagged this challenge that they had with their 911 dispatchers and call takers. Um, that they were experiencing really high levels of absenteeism and turnover, um, and that there were some clear indications that this was being um, driven uh, by burnout. Um, and as we did some exploratory research and um, engaged directly with 911 dispatchers and, and, and call takers, as well as the limited literature around their work, um, it sort of hit us with full force that being a 911 dispatcher is um, not just challenging, it can be um, emotionally uh, traumatic um, uh, for these workers. Uh, you know, you're dealing with people in crisis, um, but there's also some factors here that, that maybe weren't as evident or, or at least weren't as evident to us. Um, it's a relatively low status position, especially within the world of uh, emergency uh, responders. In, in some ways, uh, folks feel a little bit subservient uh, to, for example, police or, or fire or, or ambulance. Um, and part and parcel with this is that there's um, less sort of support, uh, workplace programming um, and, and broader supports for the well-being of 911 dispatchers. Um, they also tend to have very limited training. They, they tend to sort of learn on the job, um, which means that they don't receive training on the sort of emotional resilience. Um, potentially required to, to do this job effectively and sustainably over time. The other thing that was really interesting for us as we did this research is um, for most places, and at least in the States, I'm actually not sure if this is the same here in Canada, 
um, it's the qualifications required to become a 911 dispatcher um, are relatively modest, uh, generally just a high school uh, diploma. Um, and the pay is reasonable, uh, reasonably high uh, for that level of educational attainment. And what that can mean is often 911 dispatchers who don't really um, sort of click with the job uh, end up staying in the job longer than they would otherwise because it's hard to find equivalently well-paying work. Um, and so these factors, and I, I'm sure that, that there are others, these are the ones that um, sort of jumped out at us in our research, um, lead to uh, a sort of um, a correlated set, uh, interrelated uh, set of outcomes, uh, including burnout, uh, reduced performance, uh, something I'll not sort of get into uh, as much here, but is an interesting question for future research um, in, in terms of the actual job of sort of triaging these calls and, and dispatching emergency services. Um, how do we measure the quality of that and to what extent is burnout negatively impacting the quality of that decision making? Uh, not, not really um, captured in our study, but an interesting question. Um, and, and then, of course, some of the administrative data that we see uh, and the sort of business implications for the 911 emergency centers around uh, sick leave and voluntary exits from employment or resignation. And so in order to uh, respond to these barriers uh, within uh, these challenges, within uh, very sort of limited resources, um, my colleagues and I uh, developed an intervention that was uh, sort of anchored around six weekly emails uh, that supervisors um, in these 911 departments would send to the dispatchers that they supervise. Uh, and again, this was six emails over six weeks uh, for the treatment group. And each email shared a story uh, from another uh, dispatcher and solicited further stories or narratives uh, from the dispatchers in the treatment group. Um, I'm gonna describe a little bit more um, the theory of change uh, behind uh, these emails and, and show you a few of the emails uh, in, in larger text than what you can uh, see on the, the screen here, which is of course hard to read. But I just wanted to take a moment to recognize that this work was um, uh, intellectually and, and, um, and practically uh, both led by Dr. Elizabeth Linos, um, who was formerly the head of research at the Behavioral Insights Team in North America um, in Brooklyn and is now um, a professor in the Public Administration Department at, at Berkeley. And uh, for those of you interested um, in this uh, area of research, I would strongly encourage you to follow um, uh, her work and, and her publication, someone that we continue to work closely with and that um, certainly on a personal level, I feel like is a real um, sort of leader in this, in this field and it was a joy to work with her. So these six emails, um, focused on the shared experiences of call takers and, and dispatchers with a, a, a goal of, a primary goal of fostering a collective sense of professional identity. Um, and the reason that we thought this was important is that we, we, we observed in the literature that workplace burnout is lower in environments where people's identities are built around a community and or a shared set of values. And so while our qualitative research revealed that this type of environment does exist for other emergency responders, uh, as I said, fire, ambulance, uh, police in particular, um, that really felt like it was missing for call takers and dispatchers. And, and so we hypothesized that this absence of a sense of community and a professional identity, along with shared values, was a contributing factor to the burnout that was being observed. Um, the mechanism uh, of, of storytelling, which really is sort of at the heart of this intervention, um, ha has indeed been shown to be an effective method of um, coping with the emotional stress, um, like the stress that, that we hypothesized was being experienced by these call takers and, um, and, and researchers. Um, in some ways, these narratives uh, can be more powerful and more effective than more sort of direct uh, fact-based um, uh, messaging. Um, and, and then as a sort of secondary goal, the emails were also designed to um, uh, uh, tap into this literature around self-affirmation. In other words, to help these call takers and dispatchers uh, recognize the value of the skills 
um, and the experience that they were bringing to their work um, or, or self-persuasion as it's sometimes called, um, which has also been shown to uh, uh, indicate performance improvement among uh, frontline workers in, in public sector roles where that's been studied. Um, and just as one sort of final point, and, and um, recognize I may be sort of going uh, too deep on this, but um, as one final point that I had noted down here, um, each message uh, was sort of further indirect in that um, it didn't focus on the impact that the individual call taker or dispatcher that the recipient um, of this email made, but on the impact that she or, or he, uh, in this case, it was um, uh, majority women, um, but the impact that she can have on her colleagues and or future colleagues as a way to tap into a sort of type of pro-social um, uh, motivation um, and, and something that's a little bit distinct uh, than a lot of the sort of language that's used around uh, service beneficiaries, where you focus on the impact uh, that you can have on the recipients of your service. Uh, this was actually focused on the impact uh, that you can have on your on your colleagues. Um, so here's the email that we sent in the in, in the first week, and it, and it's a lot to read, um, but again, just wanted to sort of um, highlight the sort of narrative focus in this. We start with a story about a dispatcher um, in West Palm Beach, a, a true story who, who had a, a real impact um, and then solicit the recipient of the email, which again was delivered by the supervisor, not by the behavioral insights team, um, to share stories that they feel could help new recruits uh, feel more comfortable in their jobs and gain confidence. Um, so sort of depersonalizing, indirectly getting people to reflect on the skills that they bring to the job um, through sort of advice giving. And then there was basically a Google form. So uh, for those that clicked on the link, there was a Google form that would allow them to respond to this prompt and submit this story. Uh, so I won't go through all of them, but I'll do two more. So in, 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 in week two, we shared one of the stories that had been um, uh, submitted and then solicited with a slightly different um, uh, prompt uh, to ask people to think about a coworker that you think would be or already is a great mentor for a new recruit. Um, please let us know who you would recommend as a mentor and why you think they would be great. So again, indirect mechanism to think about the skills that they bring to the job in order to do that sort of self-persuasion work. Uh, but also to build this sense of a, of a community with a shared set of values and skills, a professional identity. And then I'll, I'll, as a final example, I'll take the fifth of um, uh, the six uh, uh, emails. Um, and you can see here again, shares a story that had come in from the previous week, and this time solicits advice to a new recruit who asks, I just got signed off on my own, meaning that they're no longer uh, paired, uh, buddied with someone to take their calls. And I'm excited, but also nervous. Do you have any suggestions for a newbie? So hopefully that gives you a very sort of um, a detailed sense of the nature of the actual intervention, these, um, uh, these emails. And, and so um, with that in mind, I'll now uh, flip to talking a little bit about how we evaluated this and, and the results that we identified that we found. Uh, so this was a randomized control trial um, evaluation. It was using a sort of matched um, a pairs approach. Um, this was an extraordinarily challenging, um, uh, perhaps that's overstated. This was a challenging, um, this was a challenging uh, RCT to run from an implementation perspective. Um, most emergency uh, call centers are, are quite small with 20 or fewer staff. And so uh, what we ultimately needed to do in order to obtain the level of um, sort of sample size, statistical power, whatever you want to call it, uh, required to identify a, a treatment effect if there was one, we ended up uh, delivering the intervention simultaneously in nine cities uh, across a total of 556 call takers and dispatchers. And basically what we, what we did is within each city, um, we would um, match pairs of employees based on their history of absenteeism, which we thought would be an important um, sort of predictive uh, uh, factor, and randomly assign one to the treatment group and one to the control. 
a slightly complex um, uh, study uh, design. Um, just wanted to sort of flag that for for context for any folks on the webinar who are um, really into the weeds on the on the sort of evaluation side of things. Um, the way it worked is uh, there's a, there's actually a couple of validated surveys, sort of widely accepted, properly validated surveys on burnout. We use one called the Copenhagen Inventory, uh, which I think is about 10 items, so, so 10 questions that people answer, um, specifically designed for people in this type of occupation, um, uh, like a sort of, you know, uh, providing a service to people, uh, social workers, nurses, call takers. Um, and so we we surveyed everyone um, and then we sent out the emails and that carried over for six weeks uh, in fall 2017. Um, and then immediately after we surveyed people again, uh, looking at the uh, sort of delta between treatment group and control group. Um, and then um, we basically let six months pass or so until March 2018. And then we collected data on um, sick leave and turnover or resignations, administrative data, and then applied the survey again. And so what we found is that six months, um, what we found is that six months after the intervention, um, we were observing significant differences um, in self-reported burnout uh, between the control group that did not receive the six weekly emails and the treatment group uh, that did. Um, now, the smart response rate, as you might expect, was limited. So the, the sample on, on this data is 152 um, uh, uh, people responding uh, to all three of the surveys. Um, and uh, it's a little bit hard to interpret um, these effect sizes because it, 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 it's just sort of a, a scale um, that it's hard to sort of correspond with uh, real world outcomes on its own. Um, but what we did sort of find was this is basically the magnitude of the difference in average reported burnout between um, social workers and administrative staff in other cities. So this sort of takes people down from the stress level of being a social worker, which tends to be quite high, to the stress level of being an administrative worker, uh, which I guess is sort of more moderate. Again, it, it's hard to sort of fairly characterize these things. There's no true absolute scale. I think what's more interesting than this self-reported data, although you know this is meaningful, um, is uh, what we observed in terms of resignations. Um, so interestingly, during the intervention period, during those um, six weeks, as you see on the left-hand side of the graph here, we observed no difference. Um, uh, we we observed uh, uh, no difference uh, uh, between uh, resignations in the treatment group or control group. Uh, but what you'll see is over time, um, we observed uh, quite meaningful differences uh, with the uh, treatment group resigning at a much lower um, rate. Uh, and so, in fact, what we found uh, is that um, the employees who remained employed throughout the intervention period, so those who were exposed to the full six week treatment, um, were 3.4 percentage points. Uh, less likely uh, to resign in the following six months relative to a control group mean of 5.1%. So that's a very large difference. Um, it's, a, it's a very large difference, but I, I, I just want to sort of caution, um, and it is a statistically significant difference, but um, this is, um, it's a little bit tricky to interpret, and, and we think that more studies need to be done. So if we do include um, the sort of full uh, set of resignations that happened during the intervention, we still see an effect, but it's not statistically significant. And so um, in talking about this work, uh, we are relatively sort of cautious about uh, making strong sort of causal claims about the effect of the intervention. But I feel absolutely comfortable saying that at a minimum, this feels like a really promising uh, sort of light touch way to address burnout and see some real material outcomes um, amongst a population who, who frankly could, could really use uh, uh, the support. Um, and, and so this, you know, this was a very, very exciting project for us. We were uh, frankly pretty blown away by the results, um, uh, not, notwithstanding, um, notwithstanding the sort of caveats that I shared around the statistical interpretation. Um, uh, 
Uh, but, but, you know, really excited to do more work on this, uh, which leads me, I just wanted to sort of um, uh, quite briefly flag a project that we um, have going on right now um, uh, in Canada. Actually, I think one of the most exciting projects that we, we're doing a lot of uh, fun work right now, but this one is super cool. And it's about improving staff well-being in, in Canadian schools, uh, looking actually not just at teachers, but also at support staff and school leaders and administrators like principals. Um, and so this is in some ways building off the work on that 911 study, uh, dispatcher study, although it's a very different population, very different drivers of burnout. And so of course the nature of the intervention and the sort of uh, theory of change around this is, is quite different. Um, so, you know, we do find that while not as severe, um, sort of uh, qualitatively not as severe as what we see for 911 dispatchers and, and call takers, burnout is a pervasive uh, challenge and there's some survey data around that. Um, and this is an issue that a really cool organization based in Montreal called the McConnell Foundation, uh, apologies, I forgot to capitalize, uh, foundation should be capitalized, but uh, a great group engaged us. Uh, they've got a whole initiative around well-being in schools and uh, they engaged us to develop and test promising scalable approaches uh, to reducing burnout and increasing well-being. Um, and so what was really interesting is we've now wrapped up our, our qualitative um, and, and uh, research and, and literature review on this and um, lots of sort of fascinating insight. We learned a lot about the sort of specific stressors for, for teachers and other uh, school-based staff, uh, hearing lots of sort of structural things like uh, new curriculums come in, but they don't have adequate time to adapt their teaching methods. Uh, behavior management in classrooms is really challenging. You've got kids acting out and you can't do your core teaching role because you're managing that. Um, a lot around sort of labor disruption. We were recently dealing with this uh, with QB uh, Union in, in Ontario, but, but that's sort of really salient a lot of the time for a lot of different people. And then one thing that was really interesting, which is around as communications become between parents and teachers become more frequent and less sort of structured, there's this sense, which I don't know, I certainly feel in my own life, I imagine some other people on the webinar probably do too, this sense that like you can never really switch off, um, uh, which, which we know has a negative impact on mental health and, and well-being and increases burnout. And then we learned a lot about the protective factors or the enabling factors um, that sort of restore the well-being and reduce burnout. Uh, we heard a lot about that sort of core interaction with kids. That's why teachers and, and other school-based professionals get into this job. Um, we heard a lot about uh, peer supports and adopting collaborative approaches to, to work planning um, and, and to doing work um, uh, really help alleviate those pressures. And, and so the intervention that we've designed here and will be implemented uh, we've got, uh, as of today, over 1,200 uh, staff opted in across 140 schools in BC, uh, Alberta, British Columbia, Alberta, and Manitoba. Um, it's it's, um, it's going to be three arms to the trial, so a control group, uh, two different uh, treatment groups. Uh, one of the treatment groups is around a weekly text message program. And uh, I just wanted to show you a couple of the text messages. These are actually still not totally finalized, but uh, I wanted to just show you guys two of the text messages that I thought were sort of cool uh, that my colleagues have been developing on this one. Uh, so one is about sort of gratitude. So thank someone who has helped you in the last few days. Expressing gratitude boosts the wellness of the person you're thanking and your own. Gratitude can be the first thing to go when things are busy. Try to make time for it today and then a link to a, a website with a little bit more information and, and sort of tools uh, around this sort of uh, concept of gratitude which has a pretty strongly evidenced link to well-being and the other one you know going back to those sort of step stressors and enablers that we talked about uh, on the previous slide um, encourages people to collaborate um, and support uh, to get support from their social network. So we've got a quote from the teacher, when things are hard, my colleagues know exactly what I'm talking about. When I talk to them, I feel less alone. You're part of a community who faced the same triumphs and struggles. Small check-ins can have a bigger impact than you might imagine. And then a quick prompt, take a minute today to ask a fellow colleague how they're feeling. Um, the other uh, intervention is gonna be uh, letters from principals to staff. 
um, about the importance of turning off and their own sort of strategies in their personal and professional life as a way to sort of uh, have an authority figure give permission uh, for, you know, making some investments in one's own well-being uh, and, and burnout reduction. Uh, so that's the core thing I wanted to share. Um, I did just want to sort of wrap up here. I, I'm so thrilled. It's only three weeks uh, since we've been here in Canada. You can see my two colleagues and I here. Our, our colleagues in London uh, uh, got us a, a cookie cake that says Hello Bit Canada with the Canadian flag on it, which was uh, sweet and also uh, very sweet uh, to eat. Um, but I just wanted to sort of briefly wrap up here before I get to questions, uh, talking about sort of my vision and, and our vision uh, why is the behavioral insights team come to Canada? Uh, why do we think it's important? Uh, what are we looking to accomplish? And I think if I uh, really have to boil it down, uh, what I hope the team and I can do uh, with fantastic partners like, like Bear and the government behavioral science teams, the other consulting behavioral science team that exists in Canada, it's a really sort of rich community and a rich ecosystem. Um, we want to sort of really add some rocket fuel to that and galvanize that um, to start seeing a little bit more scale in the nudging work that's happening, both inside of organizations like this uh, well-being work, as well as the more traditional uh, nudge staff that, that focuses on uh, customers or, or clients or recipients of government services. We're also excited to get more upstream beyond nudging and really give sort of behavioral science informed advice on policy and on strategy. And we've got some great successes on this um, in the UK, like the recent design of um, the, the tax on pop on, um, on, on sugar sweetened beverages, where we basically said, advise government that behavior change would be really hard at the customer level and they should focus on producers and they should create this tax system with thresholds based on the level of sugar so that drink makers would reformulate the drinks um, to reduce sugar consumption without any need for customer side behavior change, which ended up being very successful. Um, uh, so, so that's a cool story and we really wanna replicate that. Uh, we also wanna help um, other Canadian social impact organizations, whether they're in government, nonprofit, charity, uh, develop their own capacity for doing high quality behavioral insights work. And last, we wanna be part of um, a more sort of structural solution around the dissemination and scaling of evidence-based practices in Canada. There's this uh, great sort of uh, network of centers in the UK called the What Work Centers um, that, that BIT plays a key role working within. Um, and we'd really love to do what we can to bring something like that to Canada so that teachers, principals, police, policymakers can have a really good, easy access to evidence-based practices because uh, so often we feel like we're generating this phenomenal evidence about, around what works, um, but we don't see it being sort of implemented and adapted and um, sort of played around with to the extent that, that we'd love to. Uh, so that's my little, I guess, uh, a plug or vision or whatever you want to call it for uh, uh, Bit Canada. And, and with that, hopefully I haven't gone on for too long. I, I think we're sort of doing well on time. And so I'll just go here. Uh, to uh, questions and turn it back to Matthew. Thanks, Asha, for uh, exposure to some very interesting and I'm sure uh, relatable work to most people anyway. Um, I think you were sufficiently circumspect that the uh, chat isn't blowing up with questions, but there are some that uh, I think are interesting that you might be uh, looking to answer. Um, one of the user asks if uh, you looked into any of the reasons for the resignations, uh, mainly so that you could try to associate those reasons with uh, burnout. Yeah, that, that would be great. Like if we were to have like exit interview, like qualitative data to line up, unfortunately we, we didn't have access to that um, from our city partners, uh, which, which is too bad because that would be fascinating and I think would also help give us uh, more confidence in the replicability of the results. Definitely. Um, another user asks if you were able to uh, look at the extent to which the intervention might have impacted job performance metrics. Uh, yeah, if, another one. This is actually an, an even deeper challenge um, in this very specific world of 911 dispatchers. There, there really is no evaluation. There aren't even really 
I shouldn't say this so generally, amongst the folks that we spoke to and worked with, um, there's very little sort of uh, performance evaluation among 911 call takers and dispatchers. We, we tried to do a project, um, uh, more of a data science project on this in, in Portland by trying to look at how often people triaged something. They would assign uh, calls uh, a level of priority between one and five, with three being the default. And we were wondering whether we could sort of look at how often people were not using the default as a measure of um, performance, uh, you know, at least in terms of the amount of like cognitive work that was happening as part of the job. But um, uh, unfortunately, we didn't actually even have the data to do that. And, and, and across these nine cities, there's no accepted standard. So I think it's a fascinating question, um, but unfortunately, one that we were pretty darn far away from answering. I find that uh, relatable as well. Um, <laughs> So one of the uh, users thought that your response rate on the surveys was uh, quite good and wondered whether they were incentivized. Uh, um, no, so we, we didn't, um, uh, because these were employees of organizations, um, we, we didn't incentivize them. We usually would on um, survey-based research um, outside of an organization. Um, but I think actually that was the key to, we were also quite pleased with the response rate. And I think the key was that the requests were coming from supervisors, uh, not from a sort of generic Qualtrics account or whatever. Um, so I think that helped. Um, and I think this is getting a little bit more into the realm of speculation, but something that I thought was powerful here was, I think this might've been the first time that there was like, for a lot of these employees, that there was like a really sort of like, clear evidence of management really caring about this. Not to say that management didn't, but it's not like these sort of workplace well-being initiatives were common in these work environments. Um, and so I think the level of engagement we saw and perhaps even the effect sizes that we saw um, were related to basically the fact that they, they got that people really cared and were sort of doing something. You know what I mean? Like you have to sort of tease out the the, the effect of something versus the effect of the specific thing that we were doing. And that's why, um, you know, as we do more studies in this area and work with a diversity of organizations and larger organizations with more data available, I feel like this story is going to get uh, like sort of richer, but also probably more complex to interpret. That's just speculation. Sure. On the uh, point of effect sizes there, um... Some people were interested in what the uh, magnitude of the effect size was for your intervention with some like standard metric like Cohen's D or something like that. Um, sure you know, that I don't right. have that in front of me. <laughs> uh, this is in preprint. Um, sure. uh, so I think it's publicly available with the sort of full regression tables and everything. Yep. Um, uh, but so I'll, I'll unfortunately need to pass on that question, but happy to direct people to it. Of course. Um, I think that just from a procedural basis, uh, some people seem to be interested in why you selected those particular interventions to uh, issue to 911 responders um, relative to other alternatives that might have also been considered effective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great question, and um, I feel like this is like one of those real like it's an art, not a science type of. Um, Things because obviously we like to be really sort of well grounded in the in the sort of literature um, and have a very sort of clear and coherent theory of change. And then the other sort of um, parameter is the resourcing, right? So for example, you know, traditional interventions would be like employee assistance programs, uh, counseling, other forms of mental health services, um, and uh, those were not uh, possible options from a, a 911 call center a resource perspective, uh, highly sort of constrained financially or fiscally. Okay, fair and enough. So then we were, no, sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah, and so then we were working within this world of what's the sort of light touch support, right? And I think within the world of light touch support, usually what you do is you send resources, right? It's sort of like an informational um, intervention. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence. There are actually very narrow circumstances under which that type of intervention works. And so we thought we need to do a little bit more work here. We need to really sort of apply some behavioral science to this. And 
um, as we did this sort of qualitative research to understand the drivers of the burnout and started mapping that against the literature, because there's a, the literature on how to address burnout and increase well-being is actually quite diverse. It's not like you can say like there are three things that help address workplace well-being. Like it really is sort of dependent on the work environment, um, right? So like you know, with teachers, we're dipping into this um, gratitude. Uh, literature, we think that's that's really relevant for for a bunch of reasons. Whereas we didn't feel like that literature was relevant here. Um, but but we really sort of keyed in on this uh, question. We really sort of keyed in on this um, question of this like professional identity and how that can create a sense of belonging and well being and reduce burnout because uh, it was just really sort of lining up with what we were hearing. But we have no idea. Like there were competing theories of change, absolutely. And those might even have worked better, or there might be an opportunity to uh, combine them in sort of innovative ways. And, and you know, we had sort of nowhere near the sample size required to run uh, multiple arms and test these theories against each other. Um, so I think what I can feel pretty confident is saying is that uh, this approach worked in this circumstance. Uh, what I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable saying is this is the best approach to a light touch intervention aimed at reducing burnout among Bit of a okay. long answer, I know, but it was a really good question. Yeah, I feel like that's all very fair enough. Um, there are just lots of uh, questions related to the procedure. I think really people are interested in the procedural details here and sure. exactly how you've achieved these things. Yeah. Uh, so one question, for example, that somebody had is whether you did anything specific to increase the manager senior buy-in to this project, presumably at the uh, dispatch yeah. centers. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I, I think there was probably eight months of getting, because it was very challenging, because like it's hard enough to work with, um, you know, uh, one government on an RCT like this, especially when it's a bit of an out there, well, not out there, that's unfair, but, you know, a pretty sort of novel, innovative intervention. Um, and so to try to get nine uh, emergency centers, um, you know, all to agree to a common intervention, a common timeline, a common process um, uh, was a lot of work. Um, and it was just sort of constant engagement. You know what I mean? Uh, sharing drafts, uh, getting together on a call every four to six weeks, um, staying really rooted in the problem that they were trying to solve. Right, not sort of getting it carried away with the academic research questions that we had, but continuing to ask questions like, how will this information be valuable to you? What data matters to you? How much does a resignation cost? And just really sort of hearing that we were doing it um, for them and that it was gonna be useful for them, giving them city specific reports, um, even though it sort of made us cringe to disaggregate the data in that way because could be interpreted statistically at a single city level, but just really being um, very forthright with them and responsive to them and their needs and building relationships over time. Okay, great. I, uh, another good question here. I think I want to make it even more general. It's kind of a behind the scenes question. Um, so they phrase it in such a way that, uh, do you know whether any of these emails led to any in person interactions between the supervisors and the employees that might have in some way? alter the outcome uh, of your study. But again, I think that comment can be more general. What's going on behind the scenes here? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I hope so, right? Like, I don't see that as contamination um, of the study. I see that as part of the theory of change, right? Like we want dispatchers to be talking to each other and um, talking to their supervisors about burnout and about their jobs and about their skills, we, we actually see that as um, a potential reason why it's working. Um, I'm afraid, and, and you know, I'm afraid that this is the case on a lot of our studies. We have limited insight into the sort of true mechanism of the effects that we see, right? Like in some ways we have intervention, we have results, we have a theory that connects the two, but we rarely have visibility. Right? We're not there in the room, watching people's faces, listening to them talk, thinking about how they take calls after receiving one of these um, emails. First of all, it would mess with the study. And second, we don't have the sort of time or, or resource to do that. But, you know, I think we do a ton of field experiments and I think they're fantastic because they enable us to provide really evidence-based advice to decision makers. 
um, in the organizations that we partner with. Um, what the field study struggles with, unless you have a very, very narrow, very, very tight um, intervention, in which case you often see smaller effect sizes, is that sort of revealing, that unpacking of the mechanism, which is which is often a little bit easier in a more controlled sort of like lab-based environment. And that's why I think it's so important that like our work and our ability to do our work, I think continues to be in this sort of like mutually, this may be too philosophical, but anyways, I think there's this very sort of like virtuous circle between academic researchers who really can just sort of focus on the research question, which can be really tightly defined, and applied behavioral science research organizations uh, like BIT that can look at how those things work in the field and, and there's this sort of feedback loop. So we, you know, we get sort of leading academics asking us lots of questions about our studies and getting the data. And then of course, we're sort of borrowing intervention ideas and theories of change from their work um, uh, all the time because often they are able to get more precise on mechanism. Okay, uh, I think that actually makes for a reasonably good segue to one of the other questions. <laughs> that question's kind of about the relationship between the uh, researchers and the organization that you're partnering with. Um, how do you ensure that you meet that client's needs in helping them achieve their priorities um, while also ensuring that you're maintaining some level of academic rigor in how you're approaching the, the problems? Yeah, I mean, this is this is the sort of balance that goes to the heart of of, of bits work and my role is right. It's it's doing that, you know, because we're 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 fundamentally a consulting organization, right? People sort of um, hire us uh, uh, to take a behavioral science lens to tackling some sort of high priority challenge within their organization or or with their, um, you know, the people that they serve. Um, but our work is only you know, like our like our work is only sort of uh, really valuable and useful insofar as it maintains the integrity of the research methods, right? And so it's not about being a purist or not being a purist. It's about being able to give advice that holds up, right? And that's going to replicate and that's going to be scalable because that's why we get hired. And so um, there are things that we do to sort of build that relationship and make sure that we can speak each other's language, like so that they understand when we're pushing back around using a certain type of measure or doing randomization in a way that might be preferable for them, that we're not being, that they understand we're not being obstructionist, right? We're trying to figure out a way to get at their goal because it is always fundamentally in service. You know, they hire us, right? So it is fundamentally in service of their goal. Um, uh, but if we don't maintain a sort of level of rigor, um, so anyway, so, so there's work, there's sort of education work especially folks that aren't uh, familiar with experimental uh, methods, which is the majority of our um, clients. Um, and then there is um, uh, the sort of socialization of the process, right? So we have a very sort of detailed trial protocol document. We fully define all of our analysis strategies, our implementation methods, our theory of change before we implement anything as a form of pre-registration. And we share that all with the clients. Now, some of them are more interested and some of them are less interested but it sort of fully explains our reasoning. And then we also clarify to our partners our own internal processes. So we have a head of research who's distinct from any of our project teams, and her job is to call it up, is to independently uh, review all of our trial protocols, all of our analysis um, at, at, for independent quality assurance. Um, so, Anyways, again, probably too long an answer. I feel like I've now probably totally lost the thread on the question, for which I apologize. But it's just such an important question, and there are um, so many things that we've learned over the years that sort of need to be in place in order to have um, trusting conversations that find an appropriate and meaningful balance before between tackling the issue um, that the client has identified um, in a way that's meaningful and feasible to them and maintaining the sort of fundamental nature of our work, which is about sort of rigor and evidence. I uh, don't think your answers are too long at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, switching gears a little bit here, um, when you're dealing with emergency dispatchers, I, I 
presume that uh, there's a lot of stress in that job. I think you hinted at that earlier. And uh, one of the attendees was interested in knowing whether there was any uh, backlash from these people once they learned that they had been uh, experimented on. Oh, um, we actually disclosed. Um, uh, so, so we um, uh, we did a um, based on the sort of ethics review. Um, we did a sort of full debrief to everyone that had participated in the uh, in, in the study control group or or treatment group, and we followed up with all the nine uh, dispatch centers, and uh, uh, no concerns were raised, or at least sort of flagged to us. Um, so I think again, when you're sort of uh, transparent, now we didn't um, inform people of participating in the study. The ethics review didn't deem that that was required in advance because there was sort of uh, deemed to be minimal risk of of, of harm. Um, but uh, uh, but we did disclose it, and, and no, we didn't get any blowback. Perfect. And uh, I'm going to uh, indulge myself a little bit here with the question, just because I have I have uh, some curiosities. <laughs> So I, I uh, rather like this narrative-based intervention approach, and I couldn't help but notice when I was reading the paragraphs that um, they seem to be very carefully worded. And not only carefully worded, but some words are highlighted, some are italicized. I'm mm -hmm. wondering how much thought is going into the construction of these narratives, and then maybe on that point, how sensitive your effects would be to your particular idiosyncratic way of structuring things. Yeah, uh, so first of all, something I meant to say when I was showing those slides, I actually changed the emphasis for this webinar. Um, so some of the bolding actually, um, it was more as a sort of visual aid so that I could um, sort of say the things that I thought would be interesting. Um, yeah. uh, so, I, you know, we, we did pour a, a lot of, um, Sweat and tears, no, no blood. I don't think um, into the sort of crafting of these um, emails. But again, you know, there's just like the sort of level of evidence that exists around this stuff. It really is art, you know, and, and judgment, and just sort of trying to challenge each other, getting a community of experienced behavioral insights practitioners around the uh, around the table. In this case, um, the the colleagues at at Bid, and and really just you know, asking the right questions. How does this align with the theory? How does this align with the evidence that does exist? But frankly, a lot of judgment calls. Um, the question on how sensitive the effect would be, this goes back to this uncertainty that I have on what's the effect driven by the fact that there was an intervention at all, that people care, you know what I mean? Or was it driven by the specifics of the intervention uh, design that we uh, sort of pooled so much time into. And this is something that you could find out, right, if you were to have a third um, a trial arm, which we weren't able to do, that had, um, let's say, you know, a very brief note uh, without any narrative, you know, just something, we care about your well-being, if you're feeling burnt out, come and talk to us, right? You know, you could sort of try that and then look at the delta and the effect size, and that would be interesting. Um, my hypothesis, if, if you were to just sort of ask me for my best judgment, um, not sort of making, you know, causal claims, uh, I would say that um, the fact that it was narrative in the voices and soliciting stories from 911 call takers and dispatchers was a meaningful part of the effect size. The I, uh, details of the wording... Part. I, without knowing anything, I'm, I want to agree with your hypothesis <laughs> <laughs> entirely. Um, I, would, I would further hypothesize that the, sorry, just very briefly, um, that the sort of specifics of the wording and the sort of text treatment, the bolding and italicization would have a very limited effect. That's just my guess. Someday maybe we'll uh, get a chance to check that out. Um, Sasha. thanks again uh, for doing this today. We really appreciate it. And uh, to all the attendees for uh, good questions. Yeah, uh, we'll sign off now. You. You're welcome. Just uh, a full recording of this webinar will be available at our website by clicking the side tab level uh, labeled events and then clicking the sub tab labeled bear webinar series. Our uh, next webinar will be on November 14th and we'll hear from Lisa Brenneman in the behavioral finance and innovation strategy at TD Wealth. Thank you all again for attending and uh, Sasha, thanks. It was great. You can uh, exit this webinar by closing your WebEx screen. <laughs>